Rex Stout's Nero Wolf. Starring Mabel Moore as Nero Wolf and Don Franks as Archie Goodwin. Man Alive, with special guest stars Lynn Griffin, Neil Monroe, August Schellenberg, Michael Tate, Marion Waldman, and Sandy Webster. Everything about Carla Nieder was graceful. The way she angled her chin to show off her long neck. The way she perched on the edge of the red leather chair with her legs crossed at the ankles. And the way she managed her voice when she suspected me of kidding her. You want me to spell it? No, just the domery part, please. I already have the neater. D-A-U-M-E-R-Y. Oh, D-A-U. <laughs> well, that's what we get for being so cocky about how famous we are. Now, what if somebody asked you how to spell Nero Wolf? Well, go ahead and try it. Put your fingers on my pulse and ask me. But don't ask me how to spell Archie Goodwin, which is me. That would hurt. Nita, <laughs> <laughs> you made an appointment to see me. I suppose you needed a detective. If so, tell me what for without encouraging Mr. Goodwin to start caterwauling. It takes very little to set him off. <clears throat> Who or what are Domery and Nita? Uh, Domery and Nita is as good a name as there is on 7th Avenue. But, of course, if you're not in the garment trade and know nothing about it, <laughs> I imagine your wives would know the name, all right? Uh, why? Uh, no, no wives, neither of us. That's why we caterwaul. <laughs> well, if you had one, she'd know about Domery and Nieder. The business was started 20 years ago by two men, Jean Domery and my uncle, Paul Nieder. Uh, excuse me, will it save time to tell you that I don't do industrial surveillance? Oh, yeah, I know you don't. Now, look, it's about him, my uncle. Uncle Paul was the designer, the creator... Jean Domery was the businessman, the manager, and they own the business as a 50-50 partnership. Now, I inherited my uncle's half when he killed himself. Anyway, that's how it was announced that he committed suicide a little over a year ago. Boy, that was a surprise to me. What, suicide you mean? No, that I inherited. Oh. Even though I, I was his only living relative. But I suppose he wouldn't have made me his heir if he hadn't known I had an unusual talent. What kind of talent? As a clothes designer, of course. You know, I wasn't surprised about the suicide, not really. And maybe I should tell you why. Maybe you should. Because I knew how unhappy he was. You see, my uncle was in love with Helen Domery, his partner's wife. And she just died. She was thrown from a horse and killed. It broke him up completely. He didn't leave his apartment day or night for three days. It was right in the middle of getting ready for the showings of the fall line. Then, he says, he's going away for a rest. Four days later, the news came that he committed suicide. Under the circumstances, it didn't occur to me to question it then. Huh. And do you question it now? Yeah, I certainly do. You know, I wasn't surprised either at the way he did it. He was always keyed up and dramatic about everything. So you'd expect him to do something startling about killing himself. Well, just what did he do? <laughs> he took all his clothes off and jumped into a geyser in Yellowstone Park. What? Huh? You know, under the surface of that geyser, the temperature would be far above the boiling point. Yes, that, it would seem to be conclusive. Why do you now question the suicide? Well, because I saw him last week here in New York, alive. Oh, indeed. Last Tuesday. We were showing our fall line to the press, and there was a large audience. Now, I was modeling one of my own designs when I saw him in the fifth row. Now, if you ask me how I recognize him, I can't tell you. I simply know it was him. Why shouldn't you recognize him? Because he had a bushy beard and, and he wore glasses and his hair was slick and parted on the left side. Oh, an attempt to disguise. Yeah, and it worked at first. None of the others recognized him. In the dressing room, Polly Zarella asked Bernard. Oh, that, that's Bernard Domery, Jean's nephew. Who was the man that was growing his own wool? And Bernard said he didn't know, probably from the Daily Worker. But you recognized him. No, not until I went out again to model our headliner, which is another of my designs. I took him in without being obvious about it, and well, all of a sudden I knew who he was. I just knew. My God, I, mean, I had to get off quick, quicker than I should have. And in the dressing room, well, it was all I could do to keep them from seeing me tremble. 
And no one else recognized him. Well, I'm sure they didn't. Well, there would have been a noise. A dead man come back to life. Yeah. Many of those present had known him? Yeah, nearly all of them. Well, he was famous, you know. As famous as you are. Too bad, dear. Did you speak to him? No, the minute the show was over, I hurried out front, but he was gone. Have you seen him since? No, just that one time. Ah. Whom have you told about this? No one. Not a soul. I, I've been trying to decide what I should do. Now, you say you inherited a half interest in that business from your uncle. Is the business solvent? Oh, very. Business is very good. Then why not just erase it? If you find your uncle and make him wash his hair and shave his beard, you'll have no inheritance. Your uncle will own half the business. No, I have to know what's going on, and I have to know where I stand. I'm upset. Then you should reserve decision. Never decide anything while you're upset. And, you know, in spite of your dogmatism, you may be wrong. It's true, you might have recognized him when others didn't, but others knew him intimately, too, like his business partner, Mr. Domery. Was he there that day? Did he see the man with the beard? Oh, oh. Didn't I? But I thought I'd mention that. Well, of course, Bernard Domery, the nephew, was there. I know I mentioned him. But Jean Domery, my uncle's partner, now he's dead. The devil he is. Jumped in a geyser? No, in an accident. He was drowned. He was fishing and fell from the boat. Hmm. Hmm. Where was this? In Florida, off the West Coast. When? A little over six weeks ago. Who was in the boat with him? Bernard, his nephew. Anyone else? No. And the nephew inherited that half? Oh, yes, but that's all right. <clears throat> Why is it all right? Well, that's a silly question. I merely mean that if there'd been any question of anything wrong, well, the Florida people would have attended to it. Yeah, perhaps, only it's quite a long list, isn't it? Mrs. Domery killed in a riding accident. Mr. Nita propelled into a geyser and uh, boiled. Mr. Domery hurtled into an ocean and drowned. It's not my affair, thank heaven, but... If it were, I should want better testimony than that of what you call the Florida people. <laughs> About your uncle, what did you want me for? I want you to find him. I want to see him. Now, it, it, it could take time. It would be expensive. Oh, yes, I know. I'll give you a check now. I suppose it's understood that this is extremely confidential. No reports are to be mailed or phoned to me. Everything must be done in person. Well, that, that'll present no problem, Miss Nita. The problem is where to look for a man resurrected from the dead. I'd need to know all about his former associates. No, no, oh. no, that won't help. He had no really close friends. The only person he ever really loved was Helen Domery, unless he had some affection for me. I have a suggestion, though. Uh, yes? The one thing he loved was his work, the business. Now, I believe he came there last Tuesday because he couldn't stay away. So why wouldn't he come again? Now, our next showing is this afternoon, so if Mr. Goodwin or you could come, I could arrange tickets and we could plan a signal for me to give if I spot him. Which explains what I was doing sitting in the third row when Domery and Nieder showed their fall line to buyers. 293. 293. 293. My seat gave me a clear view of the 200 customers, but there was no one answering the description of Carla's uncle. Carla appeared about a dozen times. But she didn't signal me once. So the afternoon was a waste of time for you. Oh, oh no, sir. No, it's not a waste. I saw, uh, let's see. Yes? Six of the girls that I've been waiting to marry. If you count Carla Nieder, and I don't see why you shouldn't. As to making a choice, well... Yeah, but look, type up a report see. and keep it in the client's file. Uh, I'm going to read now, Archie. Nope, I can't do it. You can't do what? Make a choice. The only way I can see to handle it is to send in an order for one of each. I'd have to marry all six. Imagine it. After the weddings, I will, of course, have to take a good size apartment between Fifth and Madison in the fashionable 60s. On a pleasant autumn evening, I'll be sitting in the living room reading the newspaper. I'll toss the paper aside and clap my hands, and in will come Isabel. She will have on a calf exposing kitchen apron with a double hemline and will be carrying a tray of ham sandwiches and a pitcher of milk. She will say seductively... 293. Make interesting motions and gestures without spelling a drop. Then she'll go, and in will come Francine. She will be wearing slim silhouette pajamas with padded shoulders and a back flaring hip line. She'll walk and wave and whirl and say, 931. Light me up a cigarette and dance out. Enter Delia. She'll be dressed in a high styled bra of handmade lace with a billowing sweep. Oh, fully. Right up to. Enter another naked carrying a basket full of bills and your checkbook. 
You have a very personal slant on women, sir. Sometimes I think Nero Wolfe's main objection to atom bombs would be that they might interrupt people while eating. So when the doorbell rang during lunch the next day, Fritz answered it and... Uh... Oh, no, Mr. Craven. Uh, Mr. Wolfe can't be disturbed at a meal. If you would be good enough to wait in the office, he's just having a dessert now. Please, Mr. Kramer. Sorry to break in on your mail. I'm sorry, Mr. Wolfe. I couldn't stop It's him. all right, Fritz. I heard. Inspector Kramer, if you haven't had lunch, we can offer no, you... No, thanks. I'm in a hurry. A woman named Carla Nieder came to see you yesterday. <clears throat> I'll have another rice cake, please, Fritz. Yes, sir. Well? Well, what? You stated a fact. I'm eating lunch. Fine. It's a fact. What did she want? Now, you know my habits and customs, Mr. Kramer. I never talk business at a meal. I invited you to join us, and you declined. If you'd be so kind as to wait in the office... No, I'll get this one, Fritz. Oh, thank you, Archie. Look, I don't give a damn about your habits and customs. I asked you a straight question. I want a straight answer. You had it. I don't have time to wait for you to finish stuffing your face. Of course, my ears were burning at the mention of our client, because Kramer only handles one kind of case, homicide. But I figured I'd better not let Fritz try to handle another interruption. What I saw through the one-way glass panel in the front door relieved me a lot. Our client, alive and unhurt, was standing on the stoop. I have to see Nero Wolf right away. Don't turn around. What? Don't, don't. There's a car pulling up to the curb with city license plates. Do you know if you're being followed? Oh, followed? Oh, I don't think so. Well, listen, Why would listen, anyone... Listen to me. When I let you in, we're going across the hall to the front room. I don't want you to make a sound until we're there, all right? Well, yes, but uh, come I on. Did... Come in, come in. What is all this? Shh. Quiet. What's the point of that? Shh. The point is that a police inspector named Kramer what? is here. Uh, He's in the dining room asking about you. Now, do you want to see him? No, I've, I've, I've already seen him. What? They've been asking me questions for hours. Why? What happened? Well, my, my uh, uncle, my... Yeah. My, my... Uh, no, 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 no. Take, take a deep breath. Come on. That's it. I want to see Nero Wolf. All right, you stay here and sit tight till we get rid of Craig. This door connects with the office and they may go in there, so please don't make a sound. Are you, are you feeling all right? I... Huh? Yes. Yes, I'm all right now. It's all right. I've not finished my gobbling yet, as you put it. I would have eaten two more cakes, and I've not yet had my coffee. Come into the office. You broke in, and you're still here. If you weren't an officer of the law, Mr. Goodwin would knock you unconscious and drag you out. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Come on, forget it, all right? All I want is to find out why Carla Nieder came to see you. You know perfectly well. I know you have a right to be told why I'm asking, and I would have told you if you hadn't lost your temper just because I arrived while you were stuffing it in. Mr. There has I... been a murder. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Last night, between 8 and midnight... At the office of Domery and Nieder on the 12th floor at 496 7th Avenue. Carla Nieder was there last night between 9 and 9.30. She admits that. And nobody else as far as we know now. She says she went to get some drawings, but that's got holes in it. The body was found this morning lying in the middle of the floor of the office. He'd been hit in the back of the head with one of those hardwood poles used to raise the lower windows. At the end of the pole has a brass hook on it. Been jabbed into his face a dozen times or more like spearing a fish. Well, you haven't said who he was. A complete stranger to all the world, apparently. And nothing on him to tell. You describe him. Oh, nuts. Who was it? The medium-sized man around 40 with a brown beard and slick brown hair parted on the left side with glasses that were just plain glass. Can you name him? Sorry, never met him. Under the circumstance, you may concede that I have a right to ask what she came to you for. It was only after she tried two lies on us about how she spent yesterday morning that we finally got it out of her that she came here. She wouldn't tell what you came for, so I came to ask you. Is Miss Nieder under arrest? Nero Wolf's residence, Archie. Let me talk to Inspector Kramer, Archie. It's for you, Inspector. Me? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Levy. Here. Answering your question, Mr. Wolf, Miss Nieder is not under arrest. They turned her loose and put a tail on her, and the tail was just on the phone telling Kramer that she came here. She's in the front room. I put her there because I know how you are about having your meals interrupted. Shall I bring her in? You snippy little bastard. I am not little. So the minute we let her go, she comes here. Archie? Yes, sir. Did Miss Nieder say why she came? No, just said she wanted to see you. She spent hours down at the station and her tongue is tired. Bring her in here. Yes, sir. 
Inspector Kramer is here asking about you, Miss Nieder. Will you come in, please? I told you I'd already seen him. Miss Nieder, I am working for you, and you have paid me a retainer. Is that correct? Yes, certainly. Then first, some advice. The police could have held you as a material witness, and you'd have had to get bail. Instead, they've let you go to give you an illusion of freedom. And they are following you around. But why? Should you at any time want to go anywhere without their knowledge, Mr. Goodwin's an expert on that, and he can tell you what to do. (laughs) I understand that Mr. Kramer and his men have dragged it out of you that you came here yesterday, but that you have refused to tell them why. Is that correct? Yes. That was sensible. You are suspected of murder. But that puts you under no compulsion to disclose all the little secrets you have locked up. Uh, My position, though, is quite different from yours. What you said to me was not the privileged communication. Uh, In my business, I need to have the goodwill or at least the tolerance of the police in order to keep my license. And besides, I respect and admire Mr. Kramer and would like to help him. I tell you all this so that you will not misunderstand what I'm about to do. What? Mr. Kramer... Mm -hmm. Since your army has had several hours to poke into corners, you've learned, I suppose, that Mr. Goodwin went to that place yesterday and sat through a show. Yeah, I know about that. You didn't mention it. I hadn't come to it. Oh, your reserves, eh? Well, you heard what I just told Miss Nita. She came yesterday morning to consult me about her uncle. Yeah? What uncle? Mr. Paul Nita. He's dead. Miss Nita inherited half of that business from him. Back files of newspapers will tell you that he committed suicide a little over a year ago by jumping into a geyser in Yellowstone Park. What? <clears throat> Miss Nita told me about that and many other things. I don't remember everything she said, and I don't intend to try. The only thing I can furnish that might help you is the conclusion I formed. You want to hear it? Yes. I concluded that Miss Nita had pushed her uncle into the geyser and, becoming fearful of exposure, had come to me to get her out of it. Why, you... Shut up, you... Archie. Was that the impression you got? Precisely. Thanks for the conclusion. Did she tell you that, that she had killed her uncle? Oh, no. No, indeed. Exactly what did she want you to do? Oh, that's why I came to that conclusion. She left it vague about what I was to do. I couldn't possibly... Try tell telling me what you told Goodwin to do when you sent him up there. Uh, you remember, Archie? Oh, Sure. Sure, I remember. You told me to keep a sharp lookout and report everything that happened. And what happened was I saw six of the girls that I had been waiting to marry. Now, after the wedding... You're a goddamn liar, nice apartment. Mr. Kramer, I'm tired of this. Mr. Goodwin can't throw you out of here once you're in, but we can leave you here and go upstairs, and you know the limits of your license as well as I do. I said you're lying. Prove it! All this provocation than you've given me by your uncivilized conduct in my dining room, I'd lie all day and all night. Regarding this murder of a bearded stranger, where do I fit? Oh, Mr. Goodwin, connect us if you can. Should you be rash enough to constrain us as material witnesses, we'd teach you something of the art of lying, and we wouldn't squeeze out on bail. We'd dislocate your nose with a habeas corpus and a subjudiciendum. Now, will you leave my house at once, or do we leave you here and go upstairs? You won't get away with this wolf. Believe me, you won't. Good day, sir. Oh, well, we won't invite him to lunch again, will we, sir? Shut up, Archie. Miss Nita. Yes? Did you kill that man? Did I? Did I, did I kill my... my oh, uncle? Uh, Archie. Oh, she'll, be, she'll be all right. I think she just... <laughs> well, well, stop her. How do you stop her? Well, I could slap her or kiss her. I, I think I'll try kissing her. Mm. What the hell? Why did you do that? To stop you. See? Now, you can't blame her. I doubt if it's fear or despair or anything normal like that. It's probably hunger. I'll bet she hasn't even had breakfast yet. Is that true, Miss Nita? Haven't you had lunch? No. They kept me there, and and then I had to see you. Archie, Sir? have Fritz bring some sandwiches and beer at once. Beer, Miss Nita? I don't have to eat. Oh, nonsense. Beer? Claret? Milk? Brandy? Scotch and water. I could use that. Right. And Archie, have Fritz bring in the coffee and the rest of the rice cakes. Do you feel better now? Yeah, much better, thanks. I guess I was pretty empty. Good. You came to me as soon as the police let you go 
Does that mean that you want my help in this new circumstance? Well, it certainly does. Now, what I want to do is... We'll go faster if I lead. Mr. Kramer's quite capable of sending men here with warrants, so let's compress it. There are two points in which I must be satisfied before we can proceed. First, did you kill that man? No, I I want to... Just the no will do if it's the truth, is it? Yes, it's no. I'm inclined to accept it. Archie? I vote no. I wouldn't have had the impulse to kiss her if she jabbed a window pole into a man's face. No, definitely no. Then that's settled. The other point, Miss Nita, is this. Was the man you saw a week ago your uncle, and was it he who was killed last night? Oh, yes. Yes, it was Uncle Paul. I saw him. I went right up... You're certain? Look, I made myself go close to look at him. His face was dreadful, but he had the beard and the slick hair. I wanted to do something, but I didn't have the nerve enough, and I had to sit down to pull myself together. Now, they say I was in there 15 minutes, but I wouldn't think it took me that long to get up my nerve, but maybe it did. Anyway, I went and I pulled up the right leg of his trousers and I pulled his sock down. He had two little scars about four inches above the ankle where he'd been bitten by a dog once. I looked at them close. I had to sit down again. Oh! Well, now that's why it took me 15 minutes. I'd forgotten all about that. I sat down again. And then you left? Yes, I went home to my apartment and phoned Mr. Demarest. Who's I hadn't Mr. Even... Demarest? He's a lawyer. He was a friend of Uncle Paul's and he's the executor. So I thought I'd better phone him. Confounded, why didn't you phone me? Well, I didn't know you well enough for that, did I? I mean, how could I tell what you would or wouldn't believe? Yeah, yeah, indeed. So you decided to keep it from me, running the risk that I might glance at a newspaper. What is the law you're doing, reading up? No, I didn't get him. I phoned again at 11.30, but he still wasn't in. I intended to phone again, but I lay down on the couch and... Well, it may be hard to believe, but I went to sleep, and I didn't wake up till nearly 7 o'clock. Then I thought it over, and I decided not to tell Mr. Demarest or anybody else. I figured during a show season, there are lots of people going up and down in those elevators after hours, and I thought, well, they won't remember about me, and my name wasn't in the book because they know me so well, and they're not strict about it. Oh, boy, that was dumb, wasn't it? It was... uh... Yeah, well, of course I had to go to work as if nothing had happened. And the place was full of police and detectives when I got there. I'd only been there a few minutes when they took me into a fitting room to question me. And like a fool, I told them I hadn't been there last night when they already knew about it. (sighs) When they were through with me, I phoned Mr. Demarest's office and he was out at lunch. So I came here. Yes. Well, you said you want my help in this new circumstance. What do you want me to do? Keep you from being convicted of murder? Convicted? Convicted? Of murdering my uncle? Now, I I Uh, told you... I suggest, sir, that you lay off unless you want to make me kiss her again. She's not a crybaby. Your direct approach is something. Uh, Well, look, Miss Nita, if you're on the defense and intend to stay there, get a lawyer. I'm no good for that. If you want your uncle's murderer caught, whoever it is, and doubt whether the police are up to it, get me. Now, which do you want, a lawyer or me? I want you. All right, then we know what we're doing. In 20 minutes, I must go up to my office. I spend two hours with them every afternoon from four to six. The most urgent question now is this. Who knows that the murdered man was Paul Nita? Who besides you? Nobody. As far as you know, no one has said or done anything to indicate knowledge or suspicion of his identity. No, no, they all say they never saw him before, and they have no idea how he got there or who he is. Uh. Of course, the way his face was, you wouldn't expect no, anybody... No, I to... suppose not. But we'll assume that whoever killed him knows who he was. We'd be donkeys if we didn't. Also, we'll assume that he thinks no one else knows. That gives us an advantage. Now, are you sure you have given no one a hint of your recognition of your uncle last week? Yes, yes, I'm positive. Good. Now, do you think you know who killed your uncle? Well, no, of course not. You've no idea at all? No. How many people work there? Right now, about 200. Oh, for you. Can any of them get in after hours? Not unless they have a key, or they're let in by someone who does have a key. Well, who has keys? Well, let's see. Now, I have one. Uh, Bernard, Domarie, Polly Zarella, Ward Roper. That's all. Oh, no, no, no. Mr. Demarest has one. As my uncle's executor, he's in legal control of the half interest. Who opens up in the morning and locks up at night? And Polly Zarella. She's been doing that for years, since before I came there. So there are just five keys? Yeah, that's all. Then we know of four people with keys besides you. Now, can you get them here this evening? What? You want all four of them here this evening? Yes. Good 
Lord, I, I can't just order them around. What can I say? But they're much older than I am. All but Bernard. Anyway, they think I'm just a fresh kid. I'm only 21. That is, I will be. My God. What now? Tomorrow's my birthday. Really? I'll be 21 tomorrow. You will? Oh. Yeah. Happy birthday. Uh, Archie. Yes, sir. Go up there with Miss Nita. Get those people here by 8.30. <laughs> be with us in a minute. Now, listen. Oh, I'm listening. The trouble with Bernie is that he can't bear to decide anything, huh? especially if it's important. You might think he had to consult a crystal ball or something. Uh -huh. And then when he does make up his mind, he's as stubborn as a mule. So now what I do when I want him to agree about something is I act as if it isn't very important. I keep very calm. Very oh. calm. I'm sorry, Carla. That was Miss Doherty from Bloomingdale's on the phone. She thinks your work is better than ever. She's completely lost her head over you three. Oh. Who's this? Uh, Mr. Goodwin of Nero Wolfe's office. Mr. Bernard Domery. How do you do? Nero Wolfe, the detective? Are there two? Uh, where does Nero Wolfe come in? Well, I went to see him. I've hired him. Well, what for? To do what? Well, I think I need somebody. The police came within an inch of arresting me. You're joking. No, I'm not. They kept me there all morning, and then they even had me followed. Then you need a lawyer, not Nero Wolf. Have you seen them? No, no, not yet, but I, I will. Well, as soon damn it, you should have seen him first. Bernie, I'm not taking your time to ask you what I should have done. I'll tend to that, thank you. Miss so Nita... I want to ask you to do something. Uh, may, I, may I join in this calm discussion? This thing is crazy, absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. I think what we ought to do is just uh, ignore it, just simply ignore it. Yeah, yeah, that would be innocent and brave, but it might get complicated if one of you gets charged with murder. Charged with murder? That's right. How could we be cheddar? Why would any of us kill a man we never saw before? That's nonsense. Carla, what you want is Demarest. I'm going to phone him right now. Bernie, don't tell me what I want. I know what I want, thank you, and it's not Demarest. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Ah, Henry, I was just saying... Yes, I heard. Have I come at an awkward moment? No, certainly not. I was just about to phone you. Carla thinks she's in trouble with the police. About the body that was found here this morning. I was nearly arrested because I came here last night and stayed 15 minutes. My dear child, you should have called me at once. But I tried to phone you last night, but you weren't at home. And I couldn't get you this morning either, so I went to Nero Wolfe instead. Nero Wolfe? Maybe Why? I can clear this up, Mr. Demarest. I'm Archie Goodwin, Nero Wolfe's assistant. Miss Nieder has engaged Nero Wolfe primarily to keep her from being arrested. She is How would Nero Wolfe do that? He sent me to arrange a meeting tonight to discuss it. Miss Nieder, Miss Zarella, Mr. Domery, Mr. Roper, and you. The five people who have keys to this office. Uh, that's right. You figured that quickly. I spent most of the afternoon at the DA's office. Then I guess you can see the point of this meeting. Half past eight would suit him fine. Refreshment served. <laughs> We're summoned. I wouldn't dream of putting it that way. No, but we are. We who have keys. I offer a comment. You say that Wolf's primary function is to prevent Miss Nieder's arrest. Yes. Obviously, he intends to perform it by getting someone else arrested. That may prove to be difficult and expensive and possibly quite unnecessary. Oh. I would engage with the situation as it is now to get the same result with one-tenth the effort and expense. It's only fair to her, isn't it, to give her that alternative? You could try it, yes. What about it, Carla? It's your money. Do you want to pay Wolf to do it his way? Yes, I do. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, did you say 8.30, Mr. Goodwin? That would be best. Mr. Wolf works better when he isn't looking forward to a meal. You'll come? Certainly I'll come to save energy. To save energy? It will take less to attend the meeting than it would to argue Miss Nieder out of it. <laughs> Good. Uh, how about it, Mr. Domery? Uh, you'll be with us. I don't know. I'll think it over. Oh, Bernie! Um... <laughs> Carla, it may be inadvisable. I don't know. Uh, how long do you think you'll need to think? Uh, uh, an hour, half an hour, uh, by 6.30? I'll let you know. <clears throat> there are two more to invite, uh, Mr. Ellen and Mr. Roper. It might help if you would get them in here, or would that require some thinking, too, Mr. Domery? <laughs> you do your thinking, and I'll do mine. Polly, Ward, would you come in here right away, please? I Just cannot. as soon as I finish this. No, Let's now. Go. I need you both now. But I am behind already, all day long. Well, what is it? What's so important? This is Mr. Goodwin. He wants to ask you something. How do you do? Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> you're very busy. I can see that. I'll cut it short. Miss Nieder has hired my boss, Nero Wolf, because she's in danger of being arrested. Mr. Wolf would like to have a talk with you. Why? He wants to talk with everyone who carries a key to this place at his office at 8.30 this evening. Will you come? No. 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 I lose it my time today. I will be here all evening with Carter scouting. This is pretty important, Miss Arella. I do not think so. He was here, he is gone, and we forget it. I told that to the police, and I tell it to you. Miss Nieder is not danger. If she was danger, I would fight it off with these hands. Because she is the best designer in America or Europe <laughs> or the world. Oh, sure. Yeah, but she is not danger. No. I go back to work oh, now. Polly, I wait. Yes, I think you want to wait for Mr. Roper's vote, uh, Mr. Roper. Well, it doesn't seem to me that this is exactly the proper step to take under the circumstances. Oh. Huh? W- what's wrong with it? Well, almost everything, I'd say. Oh. It assumes that we, the five of us, are involved in this matter, which is ridiculous. One, indeed, may be involved, deeply involved, but not the other four, not the rest of us. What the hell are you getting Oh, at? nothing, Bernard. Mm-hmm. Nothing specific. Just a comment expressing my reaction. This is a joke, and if you ask me, it's a rotten one. Have you gotten around to your thinking yet, Mr. Domery? Made up your mind? No, I haven't. And who do you think you are, anyway? Just at present, I'm Miss Nieder's hired man. Now, who do you think Miss Nieder is? Some little girl asking you to please be kind and help her out? You damn fool, she owns half this outfit. Mr. Domery, you're her business partner. What couldn't she do to you if she felt like it? And the rest of you are just employees, her hired help. As Miss Nieder's representative, I hereby instruct you to report to the office of Nero Wolf at half past eight this evening. You confirm that, Miss Nieder? Yes, I confirm it. Good. You'll be there, Miss Zarella. But certainly I will be there with bells on. Fine. You, Mr. Roper. Well, the way you put it, I hardly know what to say. Is that right? It is true. Yes, it is true that at some future time, Miss Nieder will probably own a half interest in this business, in the success of which I have had some part for the past 14 years. <laughs> that is, she will if she's available. What do you mean, available? Well, isn't it obvious? Of course, you can't be expected to be objective, Bernard, but the police are usually right about these things, and you know what they think, so I merely ask. What if she's not available? Look, I warned you last night, your... Lord, I told you to watch your nasty tongue. Oh. Apologize to Carla and yeah. do it quick oh. or I'll break your neck. Apologize? I for said... what? I apologize! <laughs> Don't fire him. Don't fire him. Miss Nieder doesn't want him fired. She wants him there tonight. He'll be there. Oh. You'll be there, Ward. Do you understand? Answer me. Yes. Fantastic. Which leaves only you, Mr. Domery. You'll be there, too, won't you? I'll decide later, and I'll let you know. Oh. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We had to. Your man Goodwin dragooned us. Oh, not you, I understand, Mr. Demarest. Oh, yes, me too. Only I saw the compulsion a little ahead of the others. Well, anyway, you're here. I believe Mr. Goodwin has explained the circumstances to all of you, so I think we might start by clearing up one point. How you spent your time last evening from 8 o'clock to midnight. Will you begin, Mr. Demarest? If your man had asked that question this afternoon, it might have simplified matters. Oh, indeed? Well, it's been asked now. And now I'll simplify it. You want it all, of course. Please. The showing of the fall line yesterday brought a situation to a climax. For two years now, it began even before Paul Nieder's death. Mr. Roper here has been getting increasingly jealous of Miss Nieder's talent as a creative designer. That's not true. The reactions to this new line have made it evident that she is vastly superior to him, and this enraged him. He wanted to quit. Since his services are still valuable within the limits of his abilities, it was desirable to calm him down. And for that purpose, Bernard Domery, Polly Zarella, and Ward Roper dined with me in a restaurant last evening. We were together continuously from half past seven to well after midnight. What? All four of you? For the entire time? Yes. It does simplify things, doesn't it? Well, 
You verify that, Mr. Domery? All of it as told? Yes, I do. Do you, Miss Zarella? Oh, yes. Mr. Roper? I do not. Oh. To say Miss Nieder is vastly my superior is absolutely absurd. I have in my possession three books of clippings from Women's Wear Daily, Vogue, Harper's uh, yes, Bazaar. Yes, yes, no doubt, Bacon. no doubt. We'll allow your exception to that part. Do you verify Mr. Demarest's account of what happened last evening? No. There wasn't the slightest necessity of calming me down, as he put it. I merely wanted oh, to make the point... were you four people together from 7.30 till after midnight? Oh, that? Oh, yes, we were. I see. Um, naturally, the police are especially interested in Miss Nita, since she alone of those who have keys is vulnerable. Oh, by the way, Mr. Domery, how did it happen that Miss Nita wasn't invited to that conference? Isn't she a half-owner? I represented her interests. But before long, she'll probably be representing herself. Shouldn't she be consulted on important matters? Oh, damn it. Isn't it obvious? If she'd been there, we couldn't have handled Roper at all. He can't bear the sight of her. I do not... Even that... so, isn't it true that Miss Nita has been deliberately and consistently ignored in the management of the business? Yes. No. no. Oh, oh, yes, it's oh, insult. Please, oh, please. please. You are this. We'll finish sooner if you'll let me dominate it. I'm not implying that Miss Nieder is unappreciated. You all admit her designing talent, uh, all but Mr. Roper. And just this afternoon, one of you was quick and eager to resent an aspersion on her. No, I refer, Mr. Domery, to your assault on Mr. Roper. You leapt hot-headed to Miss Nieder's defense. Now, it isn't easy to reconcile that with your reluctance to come here this evening at her request. Well, I, I wasn't reluctant. I had to think it over, that's all. You uh, often have to think things over, don't you? Well, what's it to you if I do? Oh, it's a great deal to me. I have engaged to prevent Miss Nita's arrest for murder, and I suspect that your habit of thinking things over is going to show me how to do it. Mr. Demarest, how long have you known Mr. Domery? Six years, ever since he started to work in his uncle's business. Please give me a considered answer to this. Has he always had to think things over? Have you noticed any change in him in that respect at any time? I don't have to consider it. He was always a very decisive young man, even aggressive, until he became the active head of the business some weeks ago. But that was only natural, wasn't it? A man of his age suddenly taking on so great a responsibility? Perhaps. Miss Zarella, do you agree with what Mr. Demarest has said? Oh, yes. Bernard has been so different. And do you, Miss Nita? Well, I suppose people might have got that impression, Oh, you're but... hedging. Was there a change in Mr. Domery, as stated, about six weeks ago? Well, yes, there was, but Mr. Demarest has explained why. He thinks he has. Now we're getting somewhere. Mr. Domery, I wish to ask you some questions as Miss Nita's agent. They may strike you as irrelevant or even impertinent, but if they're not actually offensive, will you answer them? What are the questions? Are your parents alive? Yes. Where are they? In Los Angeles. My father is a professor in the university there. Is either of them conversant with your business affairs? Not especially. Well, in a vague, general way. Have you any other relatives that you see or correspond with frequently? Uh, Carla, do you want me to go on with the autobiography? She has no opinion in the matter because she doesn't know what I'm after. Can you object that my questions are offensive? <laughs> no, they're only silly. Ah. <laughs> then humor me. Or humor Miss Nita through me. Any other relatives that you see or correspond with frequently? None, whatever. For help in making decisions, manifestly it's not Mr. Demarest you turn to, nor Miss Zarella, nor Mr. Roper. Is there a banker, a lawyer, a friend, any other person or persons on whose judgment you rely for guidance in your business? Anyone at all? Well, no special person. No, I'd discuss things with people naturally, including Mr. Demarest. Oh, ha, 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 not Mr. Demarest. He has noticed a change in you. Now, this is your last chance, Mr. Domery, to drag somebody in. I don't have to drag anybody in. I'm sound mind and body in over 21. I know you are, and of a decisive and aggressive temperament, and that's why I'm making progress. Thank you, Mr. Domery. What for? Well, up to a few minutes ago when I got my head battered in by being told that you four people spent last evening together, I had no idea where my target was. Now I know. Where is he? What? Where is he, Mr. Domery? Who? No, sir, it's no good. I know. Even if I only guessed it, it'd be enough. I could give it to the police as a suspicion deserving inquiry. How long do you think it would take the police to find him? Mr. Domery, I cannot stress this strongly enough. 
Miss Nita is in serious danger of being arrested for a murder she did not commit. Look, I've had enough of this. I'm leaving. No, sir. You will not be permitted to leave this room until either you told me where he is or I've given the police time to start on his trail and cover my door. Oh, unlawful restraint with witnesses. Where is he, Mr. Domery? You can't take time to think it over now to consult him on this one. Where is he? This is awful. This, this is an, an awful thing. Stop it. You can't do this. You, you can't threaten and keep him here. It's unlawful. Now, just stop it now. It's too late, Carla. You hired him. And I must admit, you're getting your money's worth. You'd better tell him, Bernard. It may be hard, but the other way is harder. Where is he, Mr. Domery? Uh, the, the address is 816 East 90th Street, I Look, I, I, I want to phone No, him. you will be unlawfully restrained if you try. What is it, an apartment building? Yes, sir. Uh, apartment 10C. I rented it for... Uh... Is he there now? Yes, I was to phone him there when I left here. I said I'd go to see him, but he said I might be followed, and I'd, I'd better phone from a booth. What is the name? Dixon. George Dixon. Thank you. Archie? Yes, sir. Get Fritz in here and give him a revolver. I don't know how some of these mines might work. Then get Mr. Dixon and bring him here. The address... I have it written down, sir. Don't alarm him any more than you have to. I don't want you killed, and I don't want a suicide. Mr. George Dixon, what do you want? I have a message from Mr. Bernard Domery. Yes, are you George Dixon? I'm Dixon. Hand it through to me. I can't. It's verbal. Then say it. What is it? You'll have to open the door all the way. I have to see you first. You were described to me. Mr. Domery's in a little trouble. Thank you. Okay, what kind of trouble? He'll have to tell you about it. I'm just a messenger. All I can tell you is I was instructed to ask you to come to him. Why didn't he phone me? A phone isn't available to him right now. But where is he? At Nero Wolf's office on West 35th Street. Hmm. Who else was there? Well, several people. Mr. Wolf, of course, and men named Demarest and Roper, and women named Zarella and Nieder. That's all. I think you're lying. What? I don't think Mr. Domery said for me at all. I think this is a put-up job, and you can get the hell out of here hey. and stay out. Hey, okay, brother. Now, where'd I get your name and address from? A mailing list? Mr. Domery phoned you earlier to ask your advice about his going to see Mr. Wolf. Now, my understanding was that if I didn't get you there by 11 o'clock, they'll all pile into a taxi, including Mr. Domery, and come here to see you. Uh, my car's waiting up front. I took it for granted that by the time I got back, everyone there would know who was coming with me, even if one or two of them hadn't caught on before I left. I thought it would be interesting to see how they would welcome Mr. Dixon. But he took charge of the script himself as he entered the office. What the hell's the matter with you, Bernard? Can't you handle anything at all? Not this, I can't. This man, Wolf, is one for you to handle. I only hope to God that you can. Well, I'm back, everybody. I would have been back soon anyway, but Bernard has hurried it up a little. Ward! You're looking like a window display in a fire sale. Surprised to see me? Still putting up with them, Polly? Now you'll have to put up with me again. Carla, I hear you're on the way to leave the whole pack. <laughs> you're all so quiet. Can't cut your tongues. Where's Henry? I thought he'd be here. He's in the other room with Wolf. I don't know this gentleman. This gentleman is Inspector Kramer of the New York Police. You didn't tell me the police would be here. And believe me, I didn't know. Nero Wolf called and invited me. I just got here. What's going on, Goodwin? I'm still catching up. You'll have to ask Mr. Wolf. Who's this man? George Dixon, so I'm told. What kind of charade is Wolf pulling now? Oh, uh, why don't you ask him? Here he is. Ah, Archie, you're back. Yes, sir. Excellent. And Mr. Kramer, your timing was impeccable. My apologies for keeping you waiting. Mr. Demarest and I needed to discuss something. Nero Wolf, I'm Jean Domery. This is a real pleasure. How do you do, Mr. Domery? Please sit down. I was told that my nephew sent for me. He didn't. You got me here by a trick. What do you want? Sit down, sir. This may take some time. I can't give you much time. What do you want? I want to present some facts, offer my explanation of them, and get your opinion. Uh, there's a chair beside your nephew. What facts? 
You all have a right to know, I think, that the man who was killed last evening was the former partner in the business, Mr. Paul Nieder. What? What the hell? Why, my mother's milk, it was. Now, this time you've gone too far. Be quiet, everyone. Do you have deliberately withheld knowledge of the facts? Nonsense, Mr. Kramer. I have withheld nothing. You knew that when I was here this morning? No, sir, I did not know it then. I was given reason to suspect it later. You could have told me then. Oh, fooey, if I told you then what I suspected but didn't know... You'd quite reasonably have focused on the most likely-seeming culprit, my client. I've been led straight down a blind alley. I'm saving you time, Mr. Kramer. I'm giving you something. You said on the phone you could name the murderer. And I will, sir, if you'll sit down. Go ahead. <clears throat> we have here a situation that reads like a Wilkie Collins novel. Two men presumed dead, both returning to life. Now, some explanation is needed. Mr. Dixon Domery, won't you help us? You were going to give us some facts. So far, you've given us fantasy. I see. You won't help, then. Certainly not. Why should I? It's your fantasy. Well, we'll have to go about it the other way, then. When did you last see Paul Nita? About a year ago. Just before he left for a vacation. Well, that's not a very intelligent lie, sir. It can be checked. Mr. Kramer here has an army of men whose job it is to check such things. I'll ask you again. When did you last see Paul Nita? You won't answer, eh? Then I will. Mr. Kramer, if you put your men on it, I think you'll discover a meeting between Mr. Dixon and the deceased sometime after last Tuesday's showing of the Domery and Nita fall line. Quite possibly it was at Mr. Dixon's apartment. The address... He won't was... find anything. Oh, indomitable, are you? Huh? Then how about your meeting with Mr. Nita last evening at the offices of Domery and Nita when you killed him? <gasps> killed him? You accuse me in front of all these witnesses of killing that man? Oh, yes, sir. I'm certain of my ground. A record was kept of everyone that went into that building after hours last night. How did you do it, huh? A false name? A different floor given as your destination? Well, <laughs> your face is known now. The elevator operator or the commissionaire will be able to recognize you. And, of course... There's the key. What key? The one that got you into the Domery and Nieder office. The one presumed to be at the bottom of the ocean in the pocket of a drowned man. Is it in your pocket now, Mr. Domery, or did you leave it in your apartment? Oh, I see. I'm making you nervous. Look at his face, Mr. Kramer. I'm not nervous. Then perhaps you'll explain about your return from a watery grave. Why was it necessary to perpetrate such an elaborate hoax. I can explain that, and I will, at the proper time and to the proper persons, not you. It's no good, Mr. Domery. You're caught. Mr. Kramer and his men will find evidence to convict you even without this letter I have in my hand. What have you got? I'll read it to you. I suppose you all know, or most of you, that tomorrow will be Miss Nita's 21st birthday. Oh, yes. Well, I persuaded Mr. Demarest to anticipate the delivery date of this paper by a few hours. Uh, it was intended, as you'll see, only for Miss Nita, but as Mr. Kramer would tell you, evidence in a murder case has no respect for confidences. This letter is handwritten, as you can see. <clears throat> Yellowstone Park, May 16th of last year. It reads, My dearest Carla, I'll send this to Henry, sealed, and tell him to give it to you unopened on your 21st birthday. You're going to get news that I have killed myself. But I'm not going to kill myself. I fully expect to be with you again and with the work I love. I'm writing this to explain what I'm doing just in case something goes wrong. I think you suspected that Helen and I loved each other. Jean found out about us and killed her. He intended to kill me too, and he still intends to. And as you know, Jean always does everything he intends to. That's why I wouldn't leave the apartment those three days. That's why I came away and why I have to pretend to kill myself. Once he thinks I'm dead, I'll find time to think straight again and see what I can do. It may be that I'll find a way of dealing with this and that I'll be back with you before your 21st birthday. And if so, I'll get this back from Henry and you'll never see it. But if I don't get back, I want you to know the truth by this letter. If Jean should find me and kill me, I don't want him to get away with it. Your Uncle Paul. Well, Mr. Domery, nothing to say? Nothing. 
It offers a remarkable field for speculation. What, for instance, made you suspect that his suicide was a fake? Possibly you were as well acquainted with his character as he was with yours. He was certainly right about you. You didn't forget or abandon your intention to coax him out. You went on a fishing trip with your nephew and staged a drowning. <clears throat> Another speculation. How much did you tell your nephew? Did you have to let him in no. on all the... Listen to me, Carla. Whatever my uncle has done, that's up to him, but this is my part, and you've got to get it straight. He told me that someone had it in for him, and his life was in danger. He said nothing about Paul Nieder. Of course, I thought he was dead. Shut up and sit down. You lied to me. You said your supposed death would force this person to take certain steps and that the situation would soon be changed so that you could reappear. You lied to me. Yes, I lied to you because you're a weak-natured fool. Could I have told you the truth? But it isn't necessary to lie anymore since that other fool, Paul, seems to have gotten the last word. But I got him. I got Helen. And I got him. Take him away, Mr. Kramer. I'm through with him. I'll have that letter. No, sir, I'll keep it. Or rather, I'll destroy it. What? No, it's mine. Like hell it is. Certainly it is. It's in my writing. I wrote it while Archie was going for him. With Mr. Demarest's help. You won't need it. Just take him out of here and get to work. You, you, you... I hope you won't cop, Mr. Kramer. Should at the end justified the means, you got your murderer. <laughs> episode were Maver Moore as Nero Wolf, Don Franks as Archie Goodwin, and Cease Linder as Inspector Kramer. Lynn Griffin was Carla Nieder, Neil Monroe, Bernard Domery, August Schellenberg, George Dixon, Michael Tate, Ward Roper, Marion Waldman, Polly Zarella, Sandy Webster, Henry Demarest, and Frank Perry was Fritz. Music was composed and conducted by Don Gillis. Technical operations, John Jessup. Sound effects, Bill Robinson. Production assistant was Nancy McElveen and casting consultant Ann Weldon Tate. Man Alive was written and produced in Toronto by Ron Hartman. come to you uh, because I'm going to be murdered by a man called Conroy Blaney. Uh, indeed. Yes. I'm Mr. Poor. I suppose 200 men and women have sat in that chair and tried to hire me to keep someone from killing them. How many, Archie? 209. <laughs> have I taken the job? No, sir. Never. For $2 million a year, you can make it fairly difficult for a man to kill you. That's about what it costs to protect a president or a king. And even so, consider the record. I don't expect you to keep him from killing me. That's not what I came for. Then what the devil did you come for? To keep him from getting away with it. Oh, I see. Con Blaney is so damn clever that it isn't a question whether he can kill me or not. The question is whether he can manage it so he's in the clear. I'm afraid he can. Next week... Instead of Evidence, with guest stars Lally Cadeau, Sean Sullivan, Martha Gibson, Eric Peterson, and Danny Bukos. <laughs> <laughs>